My name is Nikhil Bakta, and I'm a pediatric hematologist oncologist at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. I treat children with cancer. And one of the most important and difficult conversations that I have with my patients is that first conversation. Because you see, that's when all of my parents, they know something is going on. Sometimes they may know what it is, but there's fear and uncertainty that permeates every single second that they're sitting in that chair waiting for me to come into that room. And so as they wait for me, I go in, and I start the conversation by obviously first introducing myself. And then I tell them, you're going to remember 2 to 3% of what I tell you today. That's fine. But here are two things that you absolutely need to remember. One, this is not your fault. This was not your fault as a parent. This was not your fault as a child. You didn't drink or eat something that did this. For children with cancer, you cannot screen for it. You cannot prevent it. It's just bad luck. And the second thing, and this one is really important, childhood cancer is curable. And so out of that, that point, really this is what we're looking for. So this is one of my patients from Oklahoma. I actually treated him for lymphoma. And you can see here a picture of what a ritual is that we have at St. Jude. He just completed therapy. And there's a pretty high likelihood that he's going to be cured. Because you see, childhood cancer is actually a miracle of modern science. In the 1960s, almost every child would die of their disease. But today, over 80% of children will survive cancer. And for my patients, I treat leukemias and lymphomas. That's actually greater than 95% of most of my patients will survive their disease. So this is, a, this is a celebration. And so when my patients are sitting there in that room, it's about giving them hope. And when they see this ritual done for other children, and they're standing out in the hallway or they're waiting for me to come in next, they know that their time is coming. And so as I tell my patients sitting there, you're likely cured from your disease. And as I tell the patients this is curable when they first come in, the ugly truth, the thing that I don't tell them, is that that is true for you. That is true for you in Memphis. That is true for you in the United States. But the reality is that for nine out of 10 children who live all over the world in resource-limited settings, unfortunately, that is not true. So. That's where I work. I'm a pediatric oncologist, I treat children, but I also do global health. And in that capacity, really my role and my job is to figure out how can we develop the strategies to actually treat and deliver high quality care to children all throughout the world. And so my journey, my story, actually started about four years ago. And it was through no plan of my own that it actually occurred, it was pure luck. Because you see, about four years ago, the leadership at St. Jude realized that Danny Thomas's charge to our institution, that no child should die, die at the dawn of life, that that charge did not apply only to Memphis. That that charge applied to not just kids in the United States, but that globally, no child should die at the dawn of life anywhere. And so the leadership made a decision that we needed to do more that yes, we will continue to cure the incurable, there's still 20% of children that we haven't been able to reach, but for that 90% of children that are not in the United States, not in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, we needed to actually reach those children. And so out of that, there was a new department created, a department of global pediatric medicine, the first of its kind anywhere in the world, and there were several of us that were hired into positions, and so I was very fortunate to join the team. And the mandate from the leadership was, all right, there you go, go cure children, figure out how to do it, all over the world. No biggie. <laughs> so I can do a little bit of math, I can do a little bit of statistics, and so my job in the team was, all right, let's start to figure out where are we actually starting? I can tell you 80% in Europe, but like, what about everywhere else? So 
like a diligent academic, I sat down and started to do my research and I said, okay, well, what is the global map of childhood cancer survival? Behind me, you can see what we knew up until about nine months ago. It's not a technical error. That's <laughs> literally what we knew as of about nine months ago because there was no map. I mean, there, no one knew and the reasons are far and few between. Childhood cancer just wasn't a thing that people thought about. Unfortunately, everywhere else in the world, here we're lucky, we are very exposed to it because we have family members who had the disease. There's ads for St. Jude, there's ads for, uh, for all of the different organizations that do this. But this was not even a priority on the world schedule. So not countries weren't even keeping statistics on this. So sitting at my computer and collaborating with colleagues at Harvard, we actually started to fill in that map. And for the first time, we were able to create a map of global childhood cancer survival. And the results are daunting. You can see they're squarely in the middle, all of that red. That means that that is less than 10% survival. So one in 10 children or less in parts of Africa will actually survive their disease. Asia and as well as Latin America also are lagging behind. And so as a result in this effort, we finally had a mandate. We started to understand what we needed to do. And so we were able to calculate that 37% of children diagnosed with cancer around the world will actually survive five years. So unfortunately, there's another dirty little truth underneath that number. Because you'll see in bright red letters the word diagnosed. And that's not by accident. Because you see, when children get cancer, their symptoms mimic almost everything else. They'll have a long fever. Maybe they'll have a little bump on their neck. Maybe some bruising. And in the rest of the world, that's malaria. That's tuberculosis or pneumonia. And so many children in the world are never diagnosed in the first place. They go to see their doctor. Their doctor, as, a, as you would expect, says, okay, you've got a fever, we'll give you some anti-malarial medications. They go home. They walk two days, perhaps, back to their house. They never make it back to the doctor. And those children end up dying as a result of their disease and never counted in the first place. They become missing children. And so for those children, when you start to incorporate their numbers, and these are hundreds of thousands of children, we went back and we actually calculated it out. We did all of our math and our fancy computer programs. And it actually turns out that when you incorporate them into the number, it's about 20% global survival from childhood cancer when all children are counted. And this really represents our mandate. 20% global survival, 80% global childhood cancer survival in the United States. That 2080 bookend, that is the health disparity that we're trying to solve for. So why is that the case? Why are children not surviving from cancer? And so this is a picture of, of a hospital in Africa where I work. And you can see this kind of encapsulates the entire problem all in one. And if you contrast that from my patient from Oklahoma, what do you see? Well, where's the gowns and the gloves, the things that you need to do to prevent infection? Where's the medicine? There's nothing hanging. Where's the pharmacist to mix it? The doctors, the nurses, and of course, where's the child in the bed, those missing children? This is the face of what we're dealing with. And of course, this is stark. Not everybody's starting from the same level. But you've got to understand, see, when we treat children with cancer, it's not just me or the nurse. There's an entire team. And if you miss one single piece, it's like a house of cards. The whole thing falls apart. So you've got to build an entire system. But of course, when you're starting from scratch or if you're starting to build, how do you actually prioritize? How do you start to make those decisions? So this is actually a picture that we took last week in Zambia while I was running a course with a variety of different po folks um, from St. Jude. And we brought doctors, we brought nurses and pharmacists, we brought the radiation folks, the surgeons. We also had patients and survivors. We had the Ministry of Health and we had civil society organizations. And we brought them all together. And we asked them the question, all right, let's be productive here. Using Post-its, our good old friendly Post-its, on this poster, 
start putting down all your ideas for how we can go ahead and start to actually solve the global childhood cancer survival issue here in Zambia. How do we improve survival in Zambia? Zambia is a country in Africa, in southern Africa. And so they went to, I mean, these guys were great. They listed all these things on the board, and they were really proud of themselves after the 30 minutes when we, they started to talk about that, um, all these different ideas that they had and get excited about them. And then we turned it around and we said, look, guys, all right, that's great. You did a whole bunch of things. Prioritize your top five. And it was like pulling their child away from them. I mean, there were some arguments about which one was most important and how do they make these decisions. But it's a process. This exercise that we did is the same exercise that's done on the global level every day by organizations like the World Health Organization or the United Nations and others. And except, instead of looking at different ideas for how to treat childhood cancer, they're having to look at things like pneumonia, TB, coronavirus. They're prioritizing that one through five. And as a result, until in the last year or so, childhood cancer not just wasn't the post-it that was numbered, it wasn't even on the board. We didn't even know what global survival was. So we started to run the numbers and we started to educate. And so what we did was we actually went and we talked to the World Health Organization and the United Nations. And we started using their statistics and their numbers and started speaking in their language because you see for 20, 30 years, pediatric oncologists, we were over here. We were talking in our own little jargon. We were like acute lymphoblastic lymphoma, high dose methotrexate, all of blah, blah, blah. And then over here, you had the global health community, and they're talking disability just life years and cost effectiveness and all of their lingo. And the problem was no one was talking to each other. So we started having that conversation. And we started to say, look, childhood cancer is a priority. Look at your own statistics. It's actually a child health and a cancer priority when you look at disease burden. And you tell me that it's not cost effective? Well, I actually ran the numbers, and it turns out it is. It's actually very cost effective. That's a technical term. The WHO very cost effective is actually something that they came up with. Um, they're very, very creative over there. So we pulled all these guys together and we actually, in 2018, announced a bold new initiative called the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer, such that by 2030, the global goal would be to double the cure rate for children with cancer and alleviate suffering for all others. And this was a seminal watershed moment. We finally had inserted ourselves into the global conversation. But it was also a little bit of an existential moment for those of us in the department, because that's great. We can run our math, we can do our statistics, but at the end of the day, I'm a doctor. I'm used to putting my stethoscope on my patient's chest and actually treating them for their disease and having that comforting conversation with their parents regardless of what ends up happening through their journey with the disease. And how do I do that at a global level? I can play on my computer, but that doesn't really make an impact in the hospitals that we work at. So we started to think about how can we transport our knowledge? How can we do something beyond our walls at St. Jude? And in that conversation, we actually started to have a lot of different perspectives. And so we sat down with our partners all throughout the world. And we actually started to ask them, how can we help you? What can we do at St. Jude that can actually support your teams? And this was a little scary because we were a little bit worried that people were gonna ask us for a new hospital or a bunch of equipment that was really expensive. But like everything in life, when you actually start talking to people and understand their problems, a lot of the times reality and logic kicks in. And what the two things we noticed were one, everybody was solving for the same problems. This wasn't unique to Guatemala or the Philippines or Zambia. Everybody was trying to work out the same issues. And there were a lot of creative people out there that had some good ideas, but no one was sharing it. And the second thing that we learned was that they just wanted to be empowered. They needed help to understand how do they create their teams? How do they do? How do they build what we've built at St. Jude? They saw us as yes, that city on a hill, but how can they actually achieve that? And so when we had these conversations with teams in Zimbabwe, for example, they actually said, we need to have better treatments because we don't really know how we're going to treat all of these kids. So we started working with them to adapt the treatments because we can't just take what we do at St. Jude and plop that down. That would be lethal. The bottom line is what we do at St. Jude is so advanced at times that 
you have to have that whole team. And if you don't, you have to shrink it down a little bit. The, the teams from Zambia, they said, hey, we're treating with the stuff that we have from, from India. We feel comfortable with it, but we have no idea if it's working. Can you help us to create something to collect our outcomes and to understand how that works? So we started working with them and we realized there's no actual database or structure or variable list to actually use. What do you collect? No one was giving guidance to this anywhere in the world. And then teams in Morocco and Brazil, lots of hospitals all treating cancer, but they didn't know how to work well together. So we started working on that. And as faculty, we all had our little different pieces. But what the realization and the real aha moment for us was each of us working in these different domains, in these different areas, they were all parts of a whole. It was a cycle. I could work on adapting treatment, but I needed somebody to help me to monitor outcomes. We could, once we monitor outcomes, we need to know this, the context in which that care is being delivered. And within that care context that's there, we have to be able to develop improvements and interventions and coach teams through that. And then here's the big kicker. Once we improve things, we actually need to further adapt. We need to actually move further and do this on a rapid cycle. And so we, as we started realizing what we had created, we realized we had an engine. We had for the first time developed really the engine that was going to drive childhood cancer survival around the world. And so because everybody loves our acronyms, we started by figuring out what, how we're going to name this thing. And so we called it the St. Jude Global Childhood Cancer Analytics Resource and Epidemiologic Surveillance System, which just so happens to stand for SJ Cares. It's pretty snappy. But this is a platform. This is what we can do. So yes, I can sit at my computer and run numbers to let the crows come home, but at the same time, I'm able to sit there and start coaching and mentoring and develop and deliver the, t the tools so that I know that the doctors all around the world are using that information for the patients that are sitting in front of them. Because it makes no sense for me as a doctor to go and work and live for a year or two years in some of these countries because there's not enough of us. We can't scale that. This is how we scale. And this is how we're scaling. We're already working with 120 different institutions all throughout the world, and this map is already outdated. We're continuing to grow our efforts, and we're continuing to make this vision of Danny Thomas, which really, for all of us, is what we believe, which is that no child should die at the dawn of life anywhere. Thank you.